You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 306 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. As y'all recall, we used the last couple of episodes to talk about Brandy Station. Here on the podcast, as we keep the story arc moving forward toward Gettysburg, the clash at Brandy Station on June 9, 1863, is noteworthy since it was the first engagement of the Gettysburg Campaign, and it's also significant since it proved to be the largest cavalry battle of the entire war. Although it was quite the dust-up, and even though, when all was said and done, Alfred Pleasanton's Union horsemen withdrew back across the Rappahannock, the battle, if we look at the big picture, actually didn't yield any strategic gains for either side since Brandy Station had little, if any, impact on the Gettysburg campaign. Although he rebounded nicely after being caught totally by surprise, and though his men ultimately held the field, Confederate cavalry commander Jeb Stuart was roundly criticized both within the Army and by the Southern press for being caught napping. For Stuart, who was, shall we say, very aware of his reputation, These criticisms must have stung. Almost certainly the most significant consequence of Brandy Station was its impact on the Federal horsemen. In his excellent book, Confrontation at Gettysburg, John Hoptak writes, On the Union side, Brandy Station was a statement battle, proving that the Federal cavalry was now fully the equal of its once seemingly superior foes. Thus, when Pleasanton's troopers galloped away from the field, they did so with much greater confidence. The dust had hardly settled on the Brandy Station battlefield when, on the following morning, June 10th, Robert E. Lee, undeterred by the Federals' unexpected attack, directed his infantry to continue their march north. And so, spearheading the campaign, the rebel foot soldiers of Ewell's Corps marched away from Culpeper and headed for the Shenandoah Valley. Yep, Uh, although the Confederate cavalry stayed put in Culpeper for the time being to rest and refit after the battle, Brandy Station delayed the march of the rebel infantry by just a single day. As Tracy said, on June 10th, the lead elements of Dick Yule's corps set out for the Blue Ridge Mountains, just 25 miles away. Yule's corps would use Chester Gap to cross over the mountains and enter the Shenandoah Valley. As y'all recall, even as Ewell's Corps and Longstreet's Corps had started the campaign by marching to Culpeper, Robert E. Lee had left A.P. Hill back at Fredericksburg to keep an eye on the Union Army. And not much was going on with the Union Army, other than sending his cavalry upriver to do battle against Jeb Stuart, Joe Hooker was still keeping the bulk of the Army of the Potomac in place there opposite Fredericksburg. As we talked about previously on the podcast, 
If Lee was moving some of the rebel army away from Fredericksburg, Hooker's first thought had been to attack there in force, across the Rappahannock, and strike out towards Richmond. But when he ran that idea by Abraham Lincoln and General-in-Chief Henry Halleck in Washington, they quashed it. Lincoln rather pointedly reminded Hooker that his primary mission was defeating Lee's army and not capturing the Confederate capital. And so, with his idea to strike across the Rappahannock in force having been vetoed by Lincoln and Halleck, pressure began to build for Hooker to move the Army of the Potomac to match whatever it was Lee was doing. But before moving the army, Hooker wanted to have a good idea of what the Confederates were up to, so that he would know how to move to counter whatever Robert E. Lee was doing. But even by June 10th, Joe Hooker still didn't think he had a clear enough picture of Lee's dispositions and intentions to start to move the Army of the Potomac. All of that's to say that for the rebels and Federals back at Fredericksburg, June 10th was just another routine day. In fact, that day, the diary entry for one of A.P. Hill's Confederate soldiers simply reported, All quiet along our lines. Meanwhile, miles away from Fredericksburg, an artilleryman in one of Ewell's columns marching toward the Blue Ridge Mountains described June 10th as a, quote, very hot and dusty day, end quote. Be that as it may, the rebel soldiers tramping towards the mountains were keyed up and ready for whatever lay ahead. A Georgia private noted, We had but few stragglers. We made excellent time. On June 12th, Ewell's lead division, commanded by Robert Rhodes, passed through Chester Gap in the Blue Ridge and descended into the Shenandoah Valley. One of Rhodes' men, Private Louis Leon, recorded their march as 56 miles in 52 hours before they reached the town of Front Royal, which is tucked along the south fork of the Shenandoah River. Private Leon took care to note that, quote, We marched through Front Royal, where the ladies treated us very good. The year before, in early September 1862, when Robert E. Lee invaded Maryland in the campaign that culminated at the Battle of Antietam, the Army of Northern Virginia had crossed the Potomac River farther to the east, and so back then there had been no crossing of the Blue Ridge Mountains. But now, in the summer of 1863, Lee planned to use the Shenandoah Valley as the route his army would take to the Potomac, and so it was here in the valley that Dick Yule would face his first testing as a corps commander. That's because the Federals were known to be holding the lower valley with large garrisons at Winchester and Harper's Ferry, and with smaller garrisons at Berryville and Martinsburg. And as the spearhead of Lee's forces, it was Yule's task to clear away those Yankees and open the way down the valley to the upper Potomac, where the rebel army would cross the river into Maryland. Once the Confederates were across the upper Potomac and into Maryland, it would be just a hop, skip, and a jump north to the Mason-Dixon line and Pennsylvania. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Awesome shows.
history never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. To open the way down the Shenandoah Valley to the Potomac, Yule would have to capture Winchester. The town, sitting astride several important roads, was occupied by about 6,900 Federals, commanded by Major General Robert H. Milroy, whose iron-fisted rule distressed local Virginians loyal to the Confederacy. Clearing this obstacle would be Dick Yule's first testing as a Corps commander. Confederate Lieutenant General Richard Stoddard Yule was 46 years old in June 1863. He was the grandson of Benjamin Stoddard, the nation's first Secretary of the Navy. Although Yule had prominent family connections, he'd been raised in near poverty on a farm near Manassas, Virginia. He managed to secure an appointment to West Point and graduated in the class of 1840. His classmates included future Union generals William Tecumseh Sherman and George H. Thomas. After graduating, Dick Yule served on the frontier with the 1st Regiment of Dragoons. During the Mexican War, he and his company formed General Winfield Scott's Mounted Escort. Yule went a brevet in Mexico and after the war served in the Southwest where he campaigned against Apaches. Among his peers, Yule was acknowledged to be, quote, a superb writer and, quote, upright, brave, and devoted, but also, quote, a queer character, very eccentric. Then came the Civil War. Yule didn't support secession, but nevertheless, he resigned his commission in the United States Army in May of 1861 and entered Virginia's military forces as a lieutenant colonel. In June, now in Confederate service, Yule became a brigadier general. He commanded a brigade at First Manassas in July, but saw no heavy fighting. In February 1862, now a major general, he received command of a division and led it with great success that spring during Stonewall Jackson's famous Valley Campaign. Jackson and Yule made a curious contrast in styles. Both were regarded as somewhat eccentric in their personal behavior, and where Yule was witty and notoriously profane, Stonewall was stern and pious. This odd pair, however, made an unbeatable combination throughout the Valley Campaign. Under Jackson, Yule developed into a first-rate division commander, but Stonewall could be a... uh, fickle master, shall we say, and what this taught Dick Yule was to use his own judgment when he was on his own, but wait for specific point-by-point orders when his superiors were close at hand. After the Valley Campaign, Yule commanded his division in the Seven Days Battles at Cedar Mountain and at Groveton, and there, in that fierce clash, which was the prelude to Second Manassas, Yule was shot in the left leg. The Federal bullet crushed his left kneecap and splintered the bone below. This gruesome wound led to the amputation of all of his left leg from the thigh downward, and while he was recuperating, he missed the battles of Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville. Despite being no Adonis, Yule had been somewhat of a romantic in his youth and a keen admirer of young ladies of quality, few of whom, needless to say, he met while serving on the frontier and chasing Apaches. In 
He had wooed his cousin, Lazinka Campbell, without success, but hadn't seriously pursued other ladies he admired. Then, during the recuperation from the amputation of his left leg, he got the chance to woo Lazinka again. By then, she was the wealthy widow of a Mississippi planter named Brown, and this time around, Dick Yule won his cousin's heart and hand. When Yule accepted the command of the Army of Northern Virginia's Second Corps, he tactfully invited Stonewall Jackson's staff to stay on with him. The staff officers were amused to note that their new commander introduced Lazinka to people as my wife, Mrs. Brown. When Yule, minus his left leg, returned to active duty after Chancellorsville to take command of the Second Corps, his assignment met with widespread approval. Jedediah Hotchkiss, Stonewall's mapmaker, recalled that, quote, no risk is run in asserting that the entire Corps desired him to be Jackson's successor, and his appointment gave general satisfaction to the officers and men of that grand body of fighters and victory winners. After meeting his new commander again, Major Sandy Pendleton, the Corps adjutant, said, quote, General Ewell is in fine health and in fine spirits, rides on horseback as well as anyone needs to, The more I see of him, the more I am pleased to be with him. In some traits of character, he is very much like General Jackson, especially in his total disregard of his own comfort and safety, and his inflexibility of purpose. He is so thoroughly honest, too, and has only one desire, to conquer the Yankees. I look for great things from him, and am glad to say that our troops have for him a good deal of the same feeling they had towards General Jackson. Ewell's Corps had three divisions commanded by Major Generals Jubal Early, Robert Rhodes, and Edward Johnson. Because of his service early in the war in the mountains of western Virginia, Johnson was known as Allegheny Johnson. On June 12, the Cavalry Brigade of Brigadier General Albert Jenkins, which Robert E. Lee had ordered over from southwestern Virginia, joined Ewell and the 2nd Corps commander gathered his lieutenants to plan their valley campaign. Ewell's plan called for the divisions of Jubal Early and Allegheny Johnson to move against Winchester, while Robert Rhodes' division, along with Jenkins' cavalry, swung off to the right to sweep up the small Berryville garrison, ten miles east of Winchester. Rhodes and Jenkins would then push rapidly down the valley for Martinsburg, which was occupied by another small federal force. By sunrise on June 13th, all three of Ewell's infantry divisions and Jenkins' horsemen were in motion. The federal commander at Winchester, Robert Milroy, turned 57 years old on June 11th. He had received reports of Confederates entering the valley, but he didn't think they were anything more than cavalry raiders. Milroy had no idea that Ewell's entire corps was bearing down on him. You guys may remember Robert Milroy from some of our episodes covering Stonewall Jackson's Valley campaign. When Milroy commanded the Union forces, at the May 8, 1862, Battle of McDowell. Now, here at Winchester, Milroy commanded some 6,900 Union soldiers. In his book, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, Alan Gelzo describes Milroy as, quote, a man of big mouth and small talent as a soldier. Gelzo writes that Milroy was, quote, an Indiana lawyer, an unbuttoned abolitionist, and, perhaps most to his advantage, a political ally of Lincoln's Secretary of the Interior, John P. Usher. Milroy's energies had been turned toward nominating himself to be Emancipation's missionary to the Shenandoah. This did little beyond antagonizing a populace already ill-disposed to Union occupation. The Virginia legislature branded Milroy a quote-unquote outlaw, 
One of Longstreet's staff officers recorded that, quote, Everywhere we hear the same talk of the oppression and cowardly cruelty of Milroy. Even Robert E. Lee branded Milroy, quote, unquote, atrocious, and suggested to Richmond that prisoners from his command shouldn't be exchanged, but ought to be held as hostages, quote, against the outrages which he is reported to be committing. Well, as you might guess from all of that, the Confederate soldiers of Dick Yule's command, as they hustled north down the valley, were, um, eager to evict the tyrannical and much despised Milroy from Winchester. The alarming news that the rebels were crossing the Blue Ridge and entering the Shenandoah Valley had been slow to reach Washington and watered down on arrival. Finally, though, at what would prove to be the 11th hour, Halleck wired Milroy's superior, Department Commander Major General Robert Shank, that Winchester, quote unquote, should be evacuated. When he was shown this dispatch, the feisty Milroy fired back that he could hold Winchester, quote, against any force the rebels can afford to bring against me. But, remember, when Milroy made that boast, he didn't have any idea that Yule's entire corps was barreling towards him. He would later defend his boast to defend Winchester against all comers by saying he thought it impossible that so large a force of rebels could slip away from under the nose of the Army of the Potomac. In any case, since Halleck had said Winchester should be evacuated, Shank decided that should was discretionary, and so he didn't order Milroy to pull out of the place. Instead, Shank told him, be ready for movement, but await further orders. At last, though, from Halleck came a direct order to pull everyone back to Harper's Ferry. At the War Department Telegraph Office, Abraham Lincoln had been following these exchanges, and now the president sent a sharply worded message to Shank, telling him, quote, Get General Milroy from Winchester to Harper's Ferry, if possible. He will be gobbled up if he remains, if he is not already past salvation. Unfortunately for the Federals, Lincoln's prediction came all too true and all too soon, because by June 13th, Yule's Confederates were approaching Winchester and closing in on Robert Milroy. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Richard S. Yule, A Soldier's Life by Donald C. Fans. If you know the story of the Battle of Gettysburg, you already know that Yule plays a starring role in one of Gettysburg's biggest and most enduring controversies regarding his quote-unquote failure to capture Cemetery Hill on the first day of the battle. Anyway, we have to admit that we have a bit of a soft spot for old Dick Yule, and although it's slim pickings when it comes to major biographies of him, we feel confident in saying that Fans' book would still get our vote as the best, even if there were a dozen to choose from. Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations in a handy list over at the podcast website which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then there's just a couple of new Strawfoot Brigade members to thank this week, but it's quality, not quantity, that counts, right? So thank you to AG and also to Carl. And Carl snuck in just under the wire right before we sat down to record today. And then a big thank you to G for their very generous donation this past week. Yes, uh, thank you. That was a nice Christmas present. And thanks to all of you for tuning in to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope that you join us again next time. But until then, take care.
Thanks, everyone. Bye.